Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I'm talking. Okay, I'm talking. Uh, Harry, I'm talking. Uh, Harry, I'm talking. No, I'm Phil. No, I'm Phil. No, I'm Phil. No. I'm Phil. I'm Phil. No, you're Harry. No, you're Harry. Look. Look. I'm Phil, you're Harry. I'm Phil, you're Harry. No, I'm Phil, you're Harry. I'm Phil, you're Harry. You guys know, I'm Pastor Phil, not him, right? That's Harry. He's lying. He's been lying to us this whole time. Like, that's not okay. So I'm going to try and deal with it, but I'm sorry for this interruption. Hang on here a minute. Got to be quiet now. We have an understanding. Okay. I think we're good. Wow. Sorry about that, everybody. Anyway, this is Harry. He wanted to get on in the action. And, and he was claiming to be me, which first I find a little offensive. But, but second, that was a lie. So for all you kids out there and adults as well, um, is lying okay? And, and the answer is no. Lying is not okay, is it? Kids, is, it, have you ever lied, kids? Adults, have you ever lied? Uh, you know. Why don't you all tell each other, yes, we've all lied, because we've all lied. But kids, have you lied to your parents about stuff? Maybe you lied about brushing your teeth before going to bed, and you didn't really brush your teeth. Or maybe you lied about um, doing your chores, and you didn't really do your chores. Or you lied about cleaning up your room, maybe, or something, or your homework, and you didn't actually do it. And, and lying, the Bible says lying is a sin, and it's not okay. Like, it's wrong. It's a sin. It's a sin against God, and it's a sin against the people that you're lying to. Harry was lying, claiming to be me. So that wasn't okay. So I'll punish Harry later, so don't worry about that. Um, but one thing we need to understand, and the reason I'm bringing this up, is because the Bible tells us very clearly that God never lies. God never lies at all. In fact, it even says that God is truth. He defines what truth is in this world. The only real truth comes from God and his word, the Bible. Kids, the Bible is always true, will always be true, and it will always apply to our lives no matter now or 20 years from now or a thousand years from now. The Bible will still always be true, and God will always be true. And that's one of the reasons, kids, that we can trust him and depend on him. Because when he promises to do something, he will do it because he never lies. And he always tells the truth and he is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, meaning the only truth. He's the only truth there is. I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only true life. And no one gets to the Father but through him. And, and that's a message of salvation for, for us kids, for you and for for everybody in the world, that Christ is the only way to be saved, to have salvation, to be saved, become a, a new life in Christ, and to be able to be s and spend eternity in heaven with him. It has to come through Christ, because he is the truth, the only truth, the only way, and, and the only way to have this new life. Uh, and that's so important for us to know, and it's so important for us to remember. And we need to think about that we are supposed to, once we're believers, once you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are supposed to look like Christ and reflect Christ everywhere we go. So if we lie to other people or if we lie to our parents or anybody, we're not reflecting Christ at all because he never lies. He always tells the truth and he is truth. So if we're lying, we're not looking like Christ and we won't bring people towards Christ. We will turn people away from Christ. And we don't want to do that. And then people won't trust us because they can't believe what we're saying. And so it matters whether we tell the truth or not. It really, really matters whether we tell the truth or not, kids. And that's so, so important. Um, adults, we want to take that same idea and that same theme, and we want to take it a little further, and as always we've done each week, and go, go deeper. So let's do that now. I'd like you to turn to John chapter 18. We're going to spend just a few moments in John chapter 18 
beginning in verses 33 and going to verse 38. And we're going to take a look at what's happening here. Uh, prior to John chapter 18, if we go back to John, well, I think it's like 13, somewhere around 13 or 14, all the way through 17, uh, is Jesus' time with his disciples. I think I'm, I'm right in there somewhere. I'm close. But, but prior to this, we see Jesus taking his disciples and they go into the upper room. All right? He washes their feet. They have the Last Supper together. Uh, Judas uh, leaves. Jesus go, gives Judas permission, go ahead and leave and do what you got to do. The disciples have no clue what he's talking about, but Judas understands, and he leaves. And Jesus then prays his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. And then after that, we know that he takes some of his disciples and they go across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And he tells them, hey, you stay here, stay alert, keep a watch, and pray, and I'm going to go off by myself and pray over here. And he goes and prays, he comes back and checks on them, and then they're asleep, and then he goes again and prays, and they're still asleep. And then, sure enough, Judas brings everybody, the mob, and, and they take Jesus captive. And so then, during that night and into the next morning, he's being interrogated by different people. And so we want to pick it up right there in John chapter 18, verses 33, and he's with Pilate at this point. He's with Pilate. And Pilate was the Roman governor of the region. Okay, he's the Roman governor of the region, of all of Palestine. So he had massive power, huge amount of power, and he would have been an extremely well-educated guy. This is a very intelligent guy, well-educated guy, and he's essentially functioning as the judge for Jesus. He's going to decide what's going to happen to Jesus or not. So he's the judge in a way. And so let's pick it up in verse 33 and let me begin reading for you there. It says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus, and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or does, uh, did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, he said, Am I a Jew? Uh, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me, so what have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered to over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate says to him, so you're a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? What is it? And so that's we want to take a look at this, at, at why Pilate answers that way. And essentially what Pilate's is saying when he says the question, what is truth? He's not really looking for an answer. He's, he's being sarcastic. And he's basically saying there is no real truth. Pilate's gotten to a place in his life, probably from all his time in politics with the Roman government, and we see that happening in, in, in government, in our government and governments all over the world, they lose sight of, of what truth is. And truth becomes relative, and Pilate has become relative for, Pilate, for, for him. Essentially, it's whatever somebody wants to believe is true. So everybody makes up their own truth. But think about what Jesus said, and Pilate still answered this way. Jesus said, look, for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth, the one and only real truth. That's what he says to Pilate. And he says, everyone who is of this one truth, everyone who is of the truth, listens to my voice. So Pilate should have asked, well, what is the truth that you're talking about? But he doesn't even bother with that. He just says sarcastically, what is truth? There is no real truth. It's just relative. It's whatever anybody wants to make it to be. And you think about this, Pilate as the judge, the one is, who a judge is supposed to like try and find out the truth, determine what the truth is, right? That's the point of a judge, is to figure that out. He doesn't even care anymore. He doesn't even care about whether it's true or not true or if Jesus really did it or didn't do it because he doesn't really believe in truth anymore. And that's a sad state of affair because at that point, no justice can ever happen. It's not possible. Um, 
what are some ways what are some ways that we as believers have maybe fallen prey to this lie that truth is relative? I want to give you a moment to think about that. How has that concept, because it's invaded our world, it's everywhere today, everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes, everybody's doing what they think is true, and it's true for me, it doesn't matter if it's not true for you, but it's true for me, what are some ways that that has crept into our culture and our mindset, even as followers of Christ? And I'm going to give you two examples. You might be have others as well. Uh, there's certainly many more, but I have two. And one is our opinions. When you look at the news, when you look at social media, when you look at any media, how many opinions are there right now just about our current situation? They're, they're almost infinite number. Everybody's got an opinion. I have an opinion. I'm sure every one of you has an opinion. Does having an opinion make it truth? And the answer is absolutely not. Does everybody believe their opinion is correct and true? Yes. But clearly, excuse me, there can only be one truth. And maybe none of them are true. There's none of us, nobody that has really all the facts. We still don't fully understand the virus. Nobody fully understands it. They're still learning. They're still trying to figure things out. So nobody even has all the facts about it except God. And probably all the people that are trying to figure out, none of them are praying to God and saying, help us figure it out. We should be help praying to help, them, help the people figure it out. But the point is, we all have opinions, okay? Second reason, I think that, or the second way that, that this truth is relative has filtered into our lives is preferences. Do you have a preference? Uh, I had a socially distanced, acceptable distance lunch with somebody this week at our church. And we had pizza. And I was asked, what do you like on your pizza? Well, clearly I have a preference for what I like on my pizza. In all honesty, I don't really care as long as there's cheese and a meat-like substance somewhere on there. You can put everything else on as well. I'm happy. I'm, I'm good with that. But I do have a preference about cake. And it needs to be chocolate cake. If it's vanilla cake, or white cake, or yellow cake, or marble cake, which is just yellow cake with one or two lines of chocolate in it anyway, right? That, that cake is no good. Carrot cake? Seriously? Somebody wants to make a cake out of a vegetable? No. I'm, that's forget it. And some of you out there are already going, ooh, I love carrot cake. Blah, 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 blah. See, that's my point. Preferences. Because I prefer chocolate cake doesn't make it true for everybody, does it? And preferences, believe it or not, are the one thing that destroys more churches than anything else. And what's the one area of the church that preferences destroy the church the most? Music. Music, music, music. But I prefer this style of music. I prefer this song better than the other songs. I prefer not to hear those instruments. I only want to hear these instruments, right? That's great. If that's the style of music you love, that's great. But church, we're not here to, to impose our preference for anything down to the color of the paint on the walls. None of it matters. We're here to encourage each other and do life together as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. We're here to worship the one and only true God. That's why we're here. And our preferences don't play into that. The only thing that should matter is truth being taught and love being shown to each other. That's the church. That's what it should look like. But those two areas of our lives, we need to remember, just because we have an opinion and just because we have a preference does not make it true. Now, let's go in a little further and look at what truth really is. Let's check some passages out here. Because um, Jesus talked about the truth. So I want to read a couple verses for us and let's look at about, let's study this thing of the truth. What is the truth? Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. So Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in your truth is the prayer. God's truth. 
Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Right? Unite my heart to fear your name. So we learn from those two verses that, that there's a truth that can only come from God. The truth that can only come from God, that's what the psalmist is desiring there. Lead me in your truth, right? I want to walk in your truth. It's a truth that can only come from God. Here's two more psalms. Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Okay? Psalm 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So we learn two things. There's a truth that only comes from God, and the word of God is truth. So essentially, that's the one thing, right? God and his word is truth. Okay? Now, let's take it a step further. John 1, 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's the word here in John 1, 14? Jesus. Jesus and the word. God and his word are the truth. Jesus and the word are truth. Right? John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. There is only one who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So what do we learn here? God is the only true God. There is only one truth in this world, and it's from God, and it's his word. His spoken word, his revealed word, his revelation of himself in his son, Jesus Christ. And throughout scripture, we see the word and Jesus, they're synonyms for each other. Christ, the Bible, is Christ in the form of word, and it is truth. It is truth. Numbers 23, 18, Titus 1 and 2, and Hebrews 6, 18. I'm not going to read them, but all three of those verses say specifically that God does not lie. Just like I shared with the kids earlier. God does not lie. So we know, God's tell, we know God tells the truth. We know God is the truth. And Christ is the revealed truth of his word. He came full of grace and truth. The veracity of God. This is our final uh, sermon in our series, Show Me Your Glory, on the attributes and the character of God. The truth of God. And what we learn from those verses and what we see here in the Bible, what we need to remember is the Bible, from front to back, every single word in here is truth. It is truth. And it needs to be taught in its entirety. There's too many churches and too many people preaching God's word and picking and choosing what they want to share and not teaching the rest. There's too many saying this part of scripture is not relevant anymore. That was because of that time period and it doesn't apply to today. That's saying that some of God's spoken word is, doesn't mean anything for us today. That's not true anymore. Well, that would mean that God could change and that he's no longer true in every area of life. And we learned last week that God never changes. We are not to change or add to anything in Scripture. We are to learn directly what it means that's here because it's God's truth, one and only truth. And it reveals his Son, Jesus Christ, to us. Nothing is true but God and his word. The Bible tells us we have three enemies. You know what they are or who they are? Well, one is yourself, your flesh. And, and you, you know the saying, I'm my own worst enemy, and, or you're your own worst enemy, right? So our flesh is not, not a good part of our, 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 what's in our heart here, right? Our sin nature, our flesh. The other enemy is the world around us. And then the third enemy is the devil or Satan, right? Those three, the devil, 
the world, and your flesh, do they want you to follow God and his truth or do they want to try and turn you away from God and his truth? They want to try and turn us away from his truth. They want to point us in a different direction. They don't want us to follow God. The world doesn't want anything to do with God. And it doesn't want you to have anything to do with God. Satan doesn't, and your flesh that's still in there doesn't either. Okay? So we need to go back to the Garden of Eden and understand this a little better, and and we're going to spend just a brief amount of time there. The Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, is so just riddled with depth uh, we're not going to get near all of it this morning, but there's, there's two things we need to understand here that, that Satan did in the Garden of Eden. We know he goes after Eve. He goes and tempts Eve, correctly, right? He, he goes and tempts Eve. And, and his whole point of, of tempting Eve was to try and get her to believe that God was withholding some, something from her, that he was lying to her. He wasn't telling her the whole truth, which is deceitful and a lie. And he says to Eve, did God really say this? Is this really what God said? Are you sure? Because I don't think that's what he meant. This is what he meant. And Satan, his whole goal here was to try and turn Eve away from God's truth and get her to believe his lie. So the father of lies, the devil, Satan himself, lies to us or twists the truth to try and pull us away from God's one and only truth and to believe something else that looks kind of like the truth, but it's counterfeit. It's not really the truth. And he succeeded. He turned her away from God. She had to choose. Am I going to believe God? And am I going to trust God? Or am I going to believe Satan and trust Satan? Which am I going to do? And she turned and trust Satan. We are faced with that same temptation each and every day. Each and every day. Now there's even more depth to, to what Satan did here in the garden. So one of his goals was, was to get them to not believe God was, was truth anymore, to believe that God, God had lied to them, deceived them, and that there's another truth that's better for them, which is actually the one that enslaves and, and kills us, right? So that was his one goal, and there's many here, but we're just going to deal with two. The second goal was to usurp the authority of God, to take away any authority that God had in their lives, to, to, to twist and mess up the chain of command or the hierarchy that God had established right from the beginning. And we're told what that is in, in um, 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen, that Christ is the head of the church, and then he's the head of the man, the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. So God, Christ, man, woman. Again, are man and woman both equal in God's eyes? Absolutely. Does God value both man and woman equally? Absolutely. Does the role of the man and the role of the woman, are they of equal importance? Absolutely. But are the roles different? Yes. That's it. And in those roles, God established the man and then the woman to be under him. At some point, somebody has to be held accountable. So the man is held accountable for the marriage. Satan went after Eve. Now let's think through this a little bit. The Bible says a lot of things, and people say, well, she was the weaker vessel. Yes, that's true. That's in Scripture as well. But look at what he's doing to mess up God's authority, and then to also that will mess up the truth of who God is. If he can get Eve to, to get out from under God's authority and fall under his authority, right? So he tempts Eve. She stops following God. She, she forgets the authority of God in her life, and she now falls under Satan's authority, And Adam, who was standing by and was not being the man he was supposed to be at all, that's on Adam. What Satan does is he gets Eve to follow him instead of God. He gets Adam to follow him instead of God. But he also gets Adam to follow his wife instead of the wife following him. And Satan twists everything upside down. So he gets rid of God's authority in their lives, God's established authority for them on this earth, And he gets him to believe that that his truth is better than God's truth. And all his truth is, is a lie. That's what Satan did in the Garden of Eden. We see the religious leaders trying to kill Jesus in John 8, 44. And I just want to read that for you here a, a minute. 
and you'll understand why when, when I read it for you. So they've been trying to kill him pretty much all the way through from the time he came along. But they want to kill Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in Psalm, or I'm sorry, in John 44. He says, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. We need to remember that. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you still do not believe me. And, and I read that to, to challenge us. We, need, we have those choices to make as well. I'm either going to choose to believe the truth of who God is and what he says in his word, or I'm going to choose to believe the lie. Now here's the beautiful part. Here's what's beautiful. The father of lies, Satan, made his move in the Garden of Eden. Didn't he? He made his move in the Garden of Eden. And he thought he had won. And then we have these two beautiful words, but God. But God stepped in. And God prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. That one would come, the seed of a woman. The one that he tempted, the one that he started this whole thing, that God's going to use the seed from a woman to deal with him once and for all. The seed of the woman to defeat Satan, crush the head of the serpent once and for all. And that person is the person of Jesus Christ who came to this earth full of what? Grace and truth. He sent truth to this earth to deal with Satan once and for all. And then the father of lies thought he had won again when Christ went to the cross. And then we still have those two beautiful words again, but God. But God used the death of the one who will crush the head of the serpent to provide a way for all to have new life in him. God promised a way throughout the entire Old Testament. He prophesied over and over and over again, this is the one that's going to come. This is the one that I'm going to send. This is the, the Messiah who I am going to provide salvation for the world through. This is the guy. And Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies, all of those promises, and he is the one and only son, the true word, the word. Right? It's just beautiful stuff. So now I want us to think a little bit here. What are some of the lies that we believe Satan's telling us today? What are some of the lies that Satan's telling today that we're buying into? And we can, we can turn it around, and, and I can ask the question a different way. What are some of the promises of God that you're doubting right now? Because if you're doubting any of God's promises, that's because you're buying into some of Satan's lies about God. So what are, what are some of God's promises that we're doubting right now? Maybe, maybe we don't really believe God's going to provide for all, all of our needs right now. Maybe we don't really believe God will protect us. Maybe we don't really believe that um, God is, is big enough to deal with this mess that's going on in the world. Maybe, maybe we've bought into the idea that God's not strong enough. Maybe we've bought into the idea that, that we're not good enough for God and we could never be saved. I've heard person after person say, from the things I've done in my past, there's no way God could save me. Maybe we've bought into this idea that, that I'm not really forgiven for stuff from my past and I still need to work harder to, to make up for them. That, that's a lie from Satan, right? Maybe, maybe we've bought into this idea that uh, because I'm saved, I'm better than other people. That's a lie from Satan. There's so many things that Satan tries to tempt us with and tell us our flesh that are not from God they are not from God. Um, maybe we doubt that God can do the impossible. Maybe there's something in your life right now that looks impossible. And maybe you don't really believe that God could take care of what appears to be the impossible. That God can move the mountain that's in front of you. All of those are lies from Satan. And every single day we have to make a choice who we're going to believe. Am I going to believe God and his word? Or am I going to believe Satan and the world, social media, 
and, and my flesh. We need to choose God. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But to do that, we need to spend time with him. And maybe we don't know him good enough yet, so you need to spend more time with him, whatever that looks like. So what should we do? What should we do to close this out? What do we need to do right now to, um, based on the fact that of the veracity of God, that God is truth, the one and only true God, the one and only giver of truth, the one, his standard is truth, not the world's, his. What do we need to do? How do we need to live in light of that? And, and the first one, I have four things um, on your insert. If you want, you can add many more than this. Please add more to it. But I have four. The first thing is we need to trust and believe that, that God really is the true God, the truth of God and, and the truth of his word. And it's our first core value here at Mill Creek Bible Church, God and his word. We need to truly believe with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength that he and his word are truth. And they are the only standard that we are going to allow to rule and reign in our hearts and our minds. He is truth. It starts right there. That's the foundation. Jesus is the rock, right? It starts there at the foundation. Second, we must trust in God and in his promises. We have got to put our trust in him and in his promises, which means, number one, we need to know what his promises are. We actually need to know what they are. Trust in the fact that that he promises to never leave us or forsake us. Trust in the fact that he promises to provide for all of our needs, not our wants or desires, but our needs. Right? Those, there's two just simple ones. Um, trust in the fact that he loves you unconditionally. Okay? There's three for you. We need to trust in God's promises. Um, because when we're trusting in his promises, we're trusting in his character, who he is. He is a faithful God, right? That he's an all-powerful God. All the, all the attributes that we've gone through in this series, that he is all of those things. When we trust in his promises, when we trust in him and his word, we're trusting in who he is, who he says he is. The third thing, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24 says we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Um, so what does that mean? Well, truth here means that we worship what I just said about what is true of God. And again, his attributes, his character, his word. We worship what is true about him. All the things that we've just learned in this series, we worship that. That is truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. We worship our Lord and Savior. And we worship that about him. Okay? Who he is, who he says he is. It's an internal thing. And, and here's where our thoughts of God matter. I've said this before. If your thoughts of God are too small, you're not going to worship him. You're not going to give him the time of day. But if your thoughts of God are bigger than life itself, you will fall on your knees before him. You will be humbled in his presence. Your thoughts of God have to be gigantic, monstrous thoughts because he's far above and bigger than even that. What does it mean to worship him in spirit? It means to worship him with every single fiber of your being. Some say what it means to worship with the Holy Spirit. Well, it says to worship him in spirit, not with the spirit. In spirit and truth. So it's every fiber of your being. Like you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you worship him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In everything you're doing. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, God does not regard our voices. He hears our hearts. And if, and if our hearts do not sing, we have not sung at all. Let me read that for you again. God does not regard our voices. He hears our hearts. And if our hearts do not sing, we have not sung at all. Do you have joy and peace in your heart right now? If you do, you'll be singing it out with your mouth. You know, we come on, on Sunday mornings, and sometimes the singing is amazing, and sometimes the singing is kind of mediocre, if we're honest. Right? And what that means is if, if I can't sing with joy, if I, can't, if I can't sing out, then I'm not singing in my heart. Something I'm missing God in my heart somewhere. I'm not worshiping him with my heart. But if I'm worshiping him with my heart and spirit and everything, 
uh, people, you'll actually be able to have joy and peace in worshiping through homeschooling right now. Imagine that. Some of the toughest stuff maybe you're dealing with in your homes right now, if, if we are worshiping God, if our thoughts of God are so big, and we have joy in our hearts, we have God in our hearts in a way that is just so awesome, we can worship him taking the trash, we can worship him doing the dishes, cleaning up, we can worship him whatever. Even in the most difficult times, because we're focused on him and his truth and who he is. The fourth thing, and this is probably the hardest for us, we need to be true in our words. We need to be telling the truth. Never lying. Never lying. I have two verses to share. Whoops, I folded, told, closed my Bible. I have two verses to share about this. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We need to be telling the truth, just like I talked to, talk to the kids at the beginning. Colossians 3, 9 and 10, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and you have now put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. We have got to stop lying, people. Lies are from the devil. And God saved you for a purpose. He saved you for the purpose uh, of, of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel with everybody, both in word and in deeds, in actions, Right? We are supposed to reflect Christ wherever we go. And if we lie to somebody, we are not reflecting God at all. Because God does not lie. He is truth. Anytime we tell somebody we'll do something and we don't show up to do it, and we lied, we did not reflect Christ to them. Anytime we make a commitment and fall short and don't do it or follow through, we've lied. And we've let somebody down. And we have not reflected Christ. And, and when we lie, we totally ruin our testimony. Whether it's to a family member, whether it's to a friend, a neighbor, or somebody we don't even know. If we lie, we ruin the testimony, and instead of pointing people to Christ, we turn them away. Our words matter. James says the tongue, the most dangerous weapon in the world. Our words matter. Four ways to focus on, four ways to live because of what we learned today, that God is truth. He and his word are, are set, to, set the bar. They're truth. We need to trust in his, him and his promises, right? We need to worship him in spirit and in truth. And we need to be telling the truth. Our words matter. They care. They should be encouraging, uplifting words, not words that are tearing down and are false. I hope you've enjoyed this series. This is the last in our, in our series um, of Show Me Your Glory. Uh, I've learned so much from it and through it, and I hope you have as well. Uh, Next Sunday, we will start our new series called Sidetracked, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy. I think we're going to spend five or six weeks in that. And then this summer, we're going to be doing the Psalms. All summer long, we're going to be looking at different Psalms uh, from the Psalms. So here's what I want to throw out to you. If you have a favorite Psalm that you would love to hear a sermon on, please email me and let me know. I can't promise we can get all of them done, but uh, some of them are already covered by we have some different speakers for the summer. But I'd love to hear from you what your favorite psalm is that you would like to hear a sermon on, and we'll try and get as many of them covered as we can. So uh, with that being said, let me close in prayer uh, uh, this, this today. Father God, we do thank you once again for the truth of your word. We thank you that you are truth. Uh, Father, and that you tell the truth. Um, That's why we can can trust you. That's why we can follow you and walk by faith. We have nothing to fear when we are following you and abiding in you. Because you're a faithful God. You're a true God, the one and only true God. Creator of heavens and earth. The giver of life. And Lord, we give you praise and thanks for that. Uh, Lord, we thank you for um, your desire to use us for your glory. Uh, We thank you for your, your... desire to to care for us and and lead us through uh, the deepest darkest valleys and and the most beautiful mountain peaks as well um, we Lord we thank you that um, uh, you have given us and entrusted to us this amazing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to share with others and father now more than ever give us courage and boldness to not just do good deeds for other people 
but to tell them why we're doing them. Because of you. Because of your son and, and what he did on the cross for us. Lord, give us courage to share that message right now because it's so greatly needed. It's needed now more than ever. And people are open and receptive right now. Lord, you've given us life. You've given us purpose. You have a plan for us. And a big part of that is getting out and sharing the gospel with others. Father, may all we do and say bring honor and glory to you. And I just pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to try something special right now. Harry's going to join me. Well, you and I, we're going to do it together. Right? We'll do it together. Do it together. Right. Do together. Right. Do together. Right. Right. Roses are red. Ro Come on, Harry. Come on, Harry. Roses are red. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Violets are blue. Never forget. Never forget. God loves you. God loves you. Amen.